high definition. Did you see that? It now says we're in high definition, Lindsay. Oh, wow. That's I like, don't even know what that means. It's like more than one and one half D. I know. We're in high definition high. now. High definition. Hey, how's this work? Jim's got to be up here like that. That's how that works. Anyway, oh, we're live. Uh, what day is it? It's Tuesday. Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Gabe, roll the clip. Hey, wait a second. Where's Andy? What time is it? Yeah, this isn't working out. Gabe, Gabe, roll the clip, man. What time is it? What time is it? It's bright. It's bright. What time is it? guitar show. Don't take it too seriously, just sit back and have some fun. That's what we do. Tonight, on Primetime, we'd like to welcome... <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have him, he couldn't do a video today, so uh, that was uh, executive producer on that cut, was Mike Benizio down in the corner, who's filling in for Andy Lund today. Tonight on the show, we have Mr. Jim Ward, and we are so excited to have you on. Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is going to get nerdy, Jim. So coming live oh, from ready. Texas, all the way from El Paso. Ooh. It's very far away from where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, Lindsay Love, always good mm -hmm. to see you. <laughs> Roger, it's wonderful to see you, buddy. Yeah, he's throwing his ball underneath my desk. Right. And, <laughs> Roger, and Roger's dad. Welcome yeah. back to the show, right. Roger's dad. Thank you very much. Happy to be pinch hitting <laughs> for the uh, for one who can't be pinch hit for, and that is Andy Lund. I will not be singing. I will not That's be fair. playing guitar. You which know is what? why I suggested that intro. <laughs> Andy, you know what's really funny is Lindsay says, <clears throat> Andy, Andy hit us up, you know, I can't yeah. do the show. There's a couple of dates I can't do the show, et cetera. And, of course, we dive right in. Take it away, Lindsay. And she's like, no. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> Nope, I can't do it. I, I can't, can't do it. I can't come up with like, and it's no slight because it's perfect for the show, but I can't, I couldn't sell, authentically sell the cheesiness of these songs. <laughs> I can't, I can't authentically sell that. It's a part of the show. The authentic so. cheese. Oh, and it's not, oh yeah, it's not a slight. I just can't do it. <laughs> no, you can't. No one can do it. No one can do it. No one can no. do it. No. I'm wearing a tiger's hat tonight. I'm so excited. Mom, I'm wearing a tiger's hat. And by the way, mom, how are you watching? Is the tiger's game over? Because you shouldn't be watching the show, mom, if the tiger's game's not over. And it's probably around the sixth inning by now. My, oh boy. Because they're playing my Yankees. Ooh. My Yankees. Let's check in real quick. Oh, man, it's the fifth inning and they're losing. The tigers are losing. The tigers are like a wonderful highlight reel this year, though, because we got Javi Baez. Yeah. But not for the next 10 days. You know, it's, it's sure, but still, we still have them. We can look at the old highlights. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <clears throat> They're not probably losing by 11. This guy is a, he's a Cleveland, what are they called? The Guardians? Gabriel, the Guardians? What the heck are the Guardians? It sounds like something out of Voltron. There was, didn't they get sued, Gabe, by the roller derby team, the Garden Guardians? They did. Look it up. They agreed to both have the Guardians as their sports team name. Anyway, Jim, welcome to the show. This is Taylor Primetime. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. As I cough. As you cough. I'm excited. Jim, Jim Ward is such a wonderful person. We have been looking forward to this episode for a very, very, very long time. Oh, um, 
He's co-founder of At The Drive-In and Sparta, two bands that were really influential in my life, uh, as I hope a lot, I see some of you in the feed over here who are, who are chatting it up. This is Sparta. That is true. Um, so we're going to get r- later on, right? Because you know we talk way too much. We talk way, way too much, right? Jim, people, there's usually a segment called Hug Your Haters. When we get hate, Andy will sing a song uh, showing them a little love because really all, all everybody needs is just a hug, right? I right. mean, you get it? They just raise in their hands. They're like, hey, look at me. I hate you. And then if you <laughs> hug them, they still might hate you, but they hate you a little less. Uh, we didn't have any hate this week, so that's good. Welcome back, everybody. Lindsay, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jay. No I feel complaints. like we... I feel like we had a couple of really good meetings today, Lindsay. We did. Right? We did. Yeah. It was I a think good we, we made some strides. <laughs> yes. That's always, that's always good. That's always a win. Apparently, we're putting out new guitars, guys. <laughs> always. <laughs> that's it. We're putting out some new guitars. So stay tuned. In the near future, more Taylor guitars. Uh, Mike, how are you doing? I'm good. I had I had a fun day at work today because somebody asked me to pinch hit for this show, so that's always a always a plus when I'm invited to come back to prime time. Yep, there we go. Yeah. I am I am the Manny Moda of of Taylor Prime Time. <laughs> Manny Moda, pinch hey. hitter. Yep, and also I see that Roger's getting a lot of love in the chat, so that makes me happy too. So Roger is a getting a lot of love in the chat. Jim, do you have any animals? Uh, we have cats. Yeah. Are they, are they fun cats? Do you have any like, cats can be. They have different attitudes. How many cats do you have? Uh, right now we have two, and they're both. Um, they have real distinct personalities, and they're they're about six months apart, and they're both just over six years old. So they're kind of in the fun. Uh, there's there's still a little bit of kittens in them, and um, yeah, they can be a little bit of a pain, but. Generally, they're they're pretty snuggly and and good to lower your stress. And I love them. I love them a lot. Or for some people, raise the stress level. My mom has this wicked fear of cats. By the way, my mom watches this show every week. She's also excited to hang out with you, especially finding out that that you're a Tigers fan. Yeah. All right. We'll yeah. get into that a little bit later. All right. So reminder in the feed, let's keep this thing nerdy, right? Let's keep the nerd in Guitar Nerd. Let's not get out of control. No, dero- nothing derogatory or hateful. We will put you in timeout, and that would be a bummer. Um, Evan's question. We do have Evan's question at the end of the show tonight. It is a care kit, just a care pack. We got some uh, with a, with one of the Koa Pictins in it, which is fun. If you don't have one of the li- the, what do they call that, Mike? Is it exclusive LTD? Do they call it a limited? What do they call it? Is there a that special name for the pricier? The <laughs> more expensive. All right. Sheaker. One of the more Sheaker. expensive pick tens with a leather satchel on the inside of it. Premium. Premium pick ten. I knew there was an adjective. All right. All right. We're going to dive into our first segment. You guys know what this one is. It's pretty simple. Hey, look at this guy, David. That's right. Go Tigers. Except for they're losing. <laughs> <laughs> Mike is you're the primetime DH right but it's a universal DH now so maybe we're gonna have to just add you all the time to the show all right uh we're gonna play a little um little game of uh what are you listening to I don't think we need to show a useless clip we'll just dive right in Jim what have you been listening to lately um so I have on my sort of Turn, the turnstile record is still sort of at the top of my at, um, top of my list. Like, and I always say that the bands, like when I listen to a record and I really, really, really want to be in that band at that moment, those are the ones that kind of stick with me for a long time. And it's just such a good record. Um, I've been listening to that a ton, basically. And then also we're we're mixing a record, so unfortunately, mostly what I listen to is is mixes of of our record, <laughs> sort of eternally the last like two weeks. Um, Sparta or 
Really? Yeah. Sparta yeah. is working on, is this new news? I mean, I think I may have known, but is this I new mean, news I, for people? I, I think if, if people sort of follow somewhat my, I, I really only communicate through Instagram. Like my management does Facebook and all the other stuff. I have no interest in it, but Instagram, I really love. Um, mostly cause it's just pictures, a lot of pictures. Um, so I've been, I've been, and also on, on, I have a Patreon and on my Patreon, I've been sort of breaking down the process, um, on this, this segment I call parks where I just talk about, you know, a bridge and a chorus. And like this week's part is going to be about mixing. So I was in the studio on Sunday, um, sort of mixing the big bulk of the, of the end part now that most of the vocals are done and um so yeah i don't think it's a total secret but <clears throat> also i'm not really you know i'm 45 i'm i'm the mystery, <laughs> the <mystery's> gone. <laughs> i'm not <laughs> i'm not too worried i'm not too worried anymore about like the secret uh you know i'm happy people still listen to the records that i make and i'm i'm so grateful that i get to still make records that i don't really worry i don't really worry about the other stuff at all <laughs> You're not Eminem trying to like drop a record tomorrow secretly. No, no, I just want to finish it. <laughs> you know what I, mean? <laughs> I just want to. At this point, I really because also and and I'll just to explain like I made the record Daggers, which I put out last year. I made that in the middle of this record, so I started making this record two years ago, right when when everything shut down, and then I'm now finishing it. So in the middle of that, I had a whole record cycle sort of. You know, like uh, like a surprise baby. Like I didn't know it just happened, and so this pro I'm I'm ready for this one to be done. To be honest, <laughs> like I'm ready for this to be out in the world and off off of my machine. That's yeah. great. We'll talk about what it's like being in a band, listening to your record over and over and over and over yeah. again, in a little bit later. Uh, but the Turnstile record is called yeah. Glow On, oh, so and good. I would agree. Um, you've probably seen this band on pretty much every late night show. They're chaotic. Um, and I would say they may or may not have been influenced in some way, shape or form it, from bands that you were involved in. So I, I feel like we're from the same school. I yeah. 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 They're fantastic. Uh, Mike, what have you been listening to? Well, Roger. as the um, Roger, yeah, I've been listening to Roger squeak his ball uh, as as he <laughs> wants me to keep throwing it to him. But to be honest, I am a huge nerd, uh, and uh, most of you that know me know that. Uh, you also know that I'm a huge Rush fan, and I've been listening to this <laughs> recently. <laughs> and Dude. yeah, it's the Rush 40th anniversary of Moving Pictures Super Deluxe. Was that like set. a? Was that like a? We don't need to talk about this. You can tell me to pound sand if you want, but was that like a billion dollars? Like, how uh, much was that investment? If I was, if I do it was ask, two hundred and ninety nine dollars and uh, worth every penny. Pretty much. I mean, it was worth most of the pennies. Uh, there's a couple of things on here that I was just like blown out by. There's a obviously there's the album. There's five LPs, three CDs, a Blu-ray, and a partridge in a pear tree. I mean, it's you know it, it's pretty comprehensive but there's there's a live album the the four of the five albums are a live album that they did in toronto it's all one show so the reason why i love it is it's warts and all they didn't go back and like fix things and clean things up and you know terry brown who produced all those great rush records in the 70s he's the one that actually came back and remixed it but they didn't go back and overdub and clean things up that's why i really love it because it's rush in the raw so it's it's pretty awesome, and you don't have to spend three hundred dollars to do that. That concert's available on Apple Music too. So, uh, I thought that because, was just one really thick record, like a thousand gram vinyl. It is. <laughs> it's a gigantic acetate. It's. <laughs> it's, it's like I wanted to do. I think. I think I told Lindsay about this. I had this bright idea once with a friend of mine to do a uh, dub plate tour with Wilco where they would take the dub plate of the pressing, which only can be spun about 20 times before it burns out. But instead of Wilco playing a show, they would invent a contraption in which to play this record and they would just sit there. <laughs> it would be like the most Wilco thing in the world, but just sit Let there and be like, it. yeah, <laughs> we're great. Anyway, okay, Lindsay, what have you been listening to? 
Um, so I've been listening to a couple of different things. Um, Roy Hargrove, he's a trumpet player, big part of the um, like Soul Aquarian movement and all that kind of stuff, Neil Soul, but also just a jazz trumpeter. So I've been listening to a lot of his stuff and then still listen to Robert Glasper, his album that came out a couple months ago. It's like, I have to sit with albums for a while and just like enjoy the body of work. So I constantly have been listening to his most recent Black Radio. And then you're going to be excited about this, Jay, and I bet you I'm taking your answer, but I've been listening to Black Star. Uh, no. Yes. Yeah. You so they, have it. Well, yeah. I mean, they oh. have, you know, um, I mean, they just dropped something that nobody expected. I was listening to Midnight Miracle podcast with Dave Chappelle and, um, you know, uh, Yazin Bey and Talib Kuli. And I was sitting there just listening to the podcast as a normal listener because I love that podcast. And then at the end there, you can tell they're kind of hinting at it and then they drop a song and it's like they haven't had a song Mine together in what has it been? 14, 15, I don't know how many years. And, um, and then they released the next the next episode of that podcast was just a song again. So like their second song. So they're definitely getting ready to drop drop it on um, his platform. So exciting times. I love it. Uh, so Instagram story real quick. I thought I truly made it in life when Jim Ward followed me on Instagram. And then shortly thereafter, Talib Kweli followed me on Instagram. <laughs> I have no idea why. It's probably because I drop like Talib stuff all the time. Like I'm a huge Black Star fan. Uh, most deaf. You've heard me talk about yeah. like, I, you know, those guys are like, I, man, see, I'm speechless. Yeah. I agree with you and I cannot wait to hear a whole album. It's going to be in incredible. Um, the other album I'm listening to, Jim, I don't know if you've heard the soul. Have you heard the new Soul Glow record? Oh, if you like the Turnstile record, you will love the Soul Glow record. Right, it's yeah. unreal. It's so good. It's not for everybody in the feed. I don't <laughs> ha hate me. There's a lot of screaming and a lot of weird time signatures and like all over the place and a little bit of hip hop. And it's just fantastic. But um, I've been waiting for this record to come out, and, and it did, and I got it, and I can, it, I love it. It's everything I've ever. <laughs> I think I've said something like it's everything I ever wanted. It's perfect. <laughs> so there's that. All right, all right. Let's get into the show. You guys need to meet Jim hmm, in a little bit more intimate way. We recently released Jim's Taylor Soundcheck which if you're familiar with our Taylor sound checks, it's a little bit of playing, a little bit of performance and a little bit of interview. Thank you for doing that, Jim. But what mm -hmm. we did, we wanted to snag one of the songs out there and let you guys hear it. It's about two minutes long. So Gabe, if you want to play day by day, and then we'll dive into conversation with Jim. Maybe. <laughs> It would be crazier, crazier to hope And that the wrongs will right themselves And to leave in your own life And don't need it for someone else It would be easier, easier to know to someone else You can't give up, you can't give in you can't give up, you can't give in you can't give up, you can't give in We're gonna get this hard way We're gonna take it day by day this hard way You're gonna take it day by day Can't give up, can't give in We can fight We can pray We 
Yeah, that's so good, man. I wish I could. I wish I could scream that part on on acoustics, but it doesn't work so well. I know, super, like on the like, record. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's super fun. I only did like eight shows on that record, but we started every show with that song, and kicking in was so much fun. That record is so good. So Jim, through the pandemic. Um, and we'll talk about that. So early 2020, you started that project uh, for your record. It's called Daggers. Um, oddly enough, this yeah. is a little gift that I received from Jim. It's a bat, baseball bat for the album Daggers. Probably having a hard time focusing on it. <laughs> Does that work? Focus? No? No? Yeah, so there's, there's a Not working. There's a baseball that company in El Paso called Power Bowl. Um, and I, I made friends with them. I play on a Sandlot baseball team and we went to go check out their baseball bats. Um, and we were talking about the record and, and uh, Kurt, the, one of the owners said, let me make you 10 bats and you can just give them away to charity or raise funds or whatever you want to do. So, um, so we sold eight of them, I think for charity. And then I just donated one at the, at, we just played a Sandlot game in Austin and, and donated one as well. So, yeah, it's cool. It's a cool company. You should check them out. And they got a couple That's of MLB cool. players now, which is awesome. Yeah, it's so exciting. Um, that was a really cool session. Um, so just j before we get into a little bit of questioning, mm -hmm. I kind of want to set Jim up real quick. All right. So Jim, he is a recent Taylor player. Mm -hmm. um, since 2020, Jim's been playing Taylor's. Uh, singer songwriter as you know he's a co-founder of the band's sparta again big influential band in my life uh and at the drive-in um and he's from el paso texas which is the only part of texas in the western in pacific time zone if if i'm in, right is that right mountain, in mountain, mountain time. time zone so yeah. and you're only an hour difference from us right now I just learned this, and I don't know why. I, why does Texas have two time zones? It's wild. It's that big. It's that big. Yeah. It's that big. It's so wild. Anyway, um, I believe you have a vegan. You and your wife have a vegan restaurant? We have a restaurant that serves a majority vegan dishes. Got it. What's the restaurant called? It's called Eloise. Eloise in mm -hmm. El Paso. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you're ever in El Paso and you're looking for some food, go to Jim's restaurant. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm um and all right let's just dive in so i i was told and um i was introduced to jim by a friend of mine by the name of chris Connolly. he's from a band called saves the day and i i've been told over the years and i'm talking about a good decade and a half that i need to meet this guy jim ward which is interesting because i'm like I'm like one of the biggest at the drive-in and Sparta fans. That, I mean, that would be really, really amazing if I met this guy. That yeah, that'd be cool if I had him, you know, in my phone and I could just call him and text him from time to time. That yeah, that would be cool. Of course, that would be cool. But over the years, people had told me, God, man, have you ever met Jim? You need to meet Jim. So, so be it. A pandemic, we end up meeting each other. He, uh, it was introduced by again by my our friend Chris. They were playing a live stream show together. And I said to Chris, hey, will you introduce me to Jim? I, I want to get him a guitar. And that was really it. It was more of an artist relations play. I'm a big fan. He's very influential in, in music. And I thought it was a good idea. All right. Fast forward. Jim comes out to LA. Or, uh, to LA and I, we found a good opportunity to go shoot that session. So I roll up in the company minivan. <laughs> he gets in the car. And we just started talking and we just opened up. Yeah. I mean, I was telling him stuff yeah. that I had never told anybody else. Yeah. And I don't know if that's, I'm maybe he communicated these things, but what I did hear is staying in tune. Hence the title of this episode, staying in tune at the drive-in made it to this peak. In my opinion, made it 
And then you had to recreate yourself once that was over into a different band. And in my opinion, you did it again. You did this. You, you were able to get and be successful in music for a very long time. So I'd like to dive into that. But I don't want to talk anymore. So I'm going to start asking you questions. Jim, right. yeah. who in the heck are you and what in the heck do you do? So I'm, a, as my Instagram will tell you, I'm a North American musician and human. Um, I think... Oh, that's super weird. Now it's just me on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was I was born and raised here in El Paso. Uh, I come from multiple generations of El Pasoans. Um, you know, I started at the driving when I was 17 out of high school because I, I just literally didn't want to go to college. And I really wanted to tour and and see the world and make music. And I was I was never too worried about uh, success or, or making it. I think I just wanted to sort of have an adventure and and when sort of that that last lineup um you know the last the, the majority of the records with that lineup when we sort of got together it just became a, ma a machine honestly like we toured all the time everywhere no excuses no complaints like just we we played everywhere all the time anywhere as much as possible um and that you know we were we were really fortunate to to play some good shows it sort of got us a, attention and we got to make some records and, and eventually made it to this point uh where we were sort of on a bunch of covers and magazines and and the record was was uh blowing up as i would say back then and we were in we were in virgin special projects which is a, a ton of attention from from a major label and i think ultimately was definitely my undoing i can never speak for other people but i was i was cooked for sure um, and I think the reason that I was able to sort of bounce or all of us kind of had a career after that is that we left with a lot of question marks. Like we stopped before there was sort of any answers to like what's possible, how far can these guys go? Like there was no sort of like peak in that band and then trying to find the pieces afterwards, the band just stopped. Like there, we don't know how big it would have been. Right. Um, and it was, it was everything you think it would be. It was best friends breaking up and it was, you know, the band stopped playing the day after I got married. So there was a whole lot of like awfulness and greatness happening at the same time. And I think I sort of immediately went to Austin and started playing with some friends um, and then sort of got recruited back to come and, and join Paul and Tony uh, to do Sparta and and then we just started again. You know, that that record and tour was like 24 months of straight, straight work. So like writing the record, making the record, and then just going back out. The the wiretap tour was 18 months long. Um <laughs> when I think about that now, it's insane that we used to we used to say, I used to tell my wife, um, cool, I'll see you in seven weeks. And it was like a normal, a normal thing, you know. Oh, I'll be back at, you know, seven weeks. Okay. It's a short one, you know. We're only going to be gone seven weeks. And I think in the year 2000, when we made relationship and started the touring for that, I was home for 21 days in 2000. And that's sort of the, um, if anyone ever asked what happened, I, I sort of just say that I was home 21 days. <laughs> like, even if you're 24, it's, it's incredibly difficult, especially I think if, you know, and, and again, I can't speak for the other guys, but for me, it was never about being famous or rich or, successful in the industry like there's a lot of the industry that i don't like and i choose to stay away from it at that time i didn't know how to navigate that by any means and i don't think there was a lot of people around us that were i think a lot of people around us were really sort of like holy shit or sorry holy this is this is crazy we're going to take advantage of it because this doesn't happen very often where this young rock band sort of breaks through the the whatever it is um and I can understand that now as an adult, like if I worked in the industry and I saw a band doing that, I would be really excited for them. Um, of course, I'd have a different perception knowing that some of those people are probably struggling a little bit more than others. Um, but all in all, like what a life it's been, it's been amazing. And, and I always say the best part is, is sort of that, that random day that you end up doing a, a video shoot and you meet someone that you're going to be friends with forever. So. <laughs> I know it, it's 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 really wild. We are akin. It's it's yeah. very into we're in tune with each other, and it's very very interesting. We have a lot of very similar friends. 
Um, in fact, I might want to play a game with you in a little bit, which would be pretty fun. <laughs> but so if, if you are unfamiliar with at the drive-in at the drive-in put a record out called relationship of command um and it was i mean i, I could go into the catalog of at the drive-in and tell you every favorite thing that you ever did i'm not going to bore the crowd over here the the, <laughs> yeah. the the feed with that because that's not what this show is about and then i could go to every sparta record and tell you what songs are fantastic for me and very influential but i don't want to do that i want to get into this 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 conversation but Thank you, Jim, for joining us on the show. We are all super excited about this because we have seen you, you, you are in tune, which is it's phenomenal to see. Um, and, and I'll probably ask and dive into. I remember you telling me that one day you guys were on tour and the next day you were done. Was that yeah. true? Well, we, we stopped the tour in, in Groningen at the Vera this place called the Vera in Holland, um, where, I mean, I, I've told the story a million times, but I, we, we had just, we kept having like small band meetings and trying to figure out how to fix what was happening um, internally without really understanding what was happening internally. Um, and we played a show and it just was like, it was over, you know, like I looked over and I just was, you know, Omar was just hitting strings, like not even fretting. And we were just so miserable um we were just burned out and it was like oh but just wait one more week you'll be playing to three thousand people in london and we're like we don't care <laughs> we really just don't care anymore at this point so we we took a break and unfortunately what should have been a a time to heal just got messed up by sort of the powers that be um which happens in this industry and i can't i can't blame anybody i'm not mad at anybody like it's been, when people ask about that band, I always say that it's, it's a, a loving, complicated relationship. And yeah. sort of leave it at that, um, because it's it's a lot of personalities and it's a lot of opinions. And and um, you know, at the end of the day, I would I would you know I love them all. But I totally I totally get that, and we'll get into that with some further conversations. You know it all. You all know what time it is. You ready for this? It's time for, hey, we switched this up. Lindsay, I think we're going to go this direction from now on. Instead of useless questions, we'll go for useful questions. Useful questions. So I have a segment here, Jim. I'm going to rifle off some useful questions for the feed. Okay. And we'll see if uh, if we can stump you. I don't think you're going to be stumped at all. Oh, these are questions for me? Yeah, these are questions for you. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Dead or alive, who is an artist you'd love to collaborate with? D. Picciotto. Who? D. From Fugazi. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What? Yes. Easily. Easily. Hey, Mike, Easily. Would, Mike, would you answer that the same way? I, I might not say it in the same... I might not use the same letters or words or person or band that he did, but I would answer it the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, what... <laughs> What accomplishments do you see yourself achieving musically in the next 10 years? So I think, like I said, I'm 45 and I'm trying to figure out how to make music. And it's always a constant struggle. Like, how do I make music that is important to me? It's not about if it's important to other people, it never has been. But I think in, in 10 years, I just kind of want to keep evolving into the like, um, you know, my, my, whatever era that is in your life, like, uh, like the Bruce Springsteen or, or the, uh, I don't know, like, I hope that I can continue to make records and, and be relevant to myself. I'm not, I have no interest in like novelty or, or like trying to stay young. I have no interest in that at all. I just want to keep making records and, and clearly physically my voice is changing with time and i'm i'm sort of figuring that out on this record has been like on on thursday i'll be at a throat specialist because i don't know what like something's going on and i'm trying to figure it out but clearly i'm gonna have to learn how to do this a different way so what i'm hoping in 10 years is that you know i put out four or five more records and i've sort of found that comfortable spot for me at 55 um to continue to tour and when i want to and make records when i want to and not um 
I just want to be productive, I guess. So my goal is to, is to, to be productive and relevant to myself. That's inspiring. The long um, time. <laughs> uh, what strengths do you have that you believe make you a great musician? Now, let me back this up real quick. I think, and I explained this when I asked this question, I think that anybody who's playing music is great. That is my opinion. Yeah. I, I think that there's too many, um, there's like an, an entrance exam with music, right? And it's like, it, let's, let's wave all that, man. If you yeah. can fret a G chord and that's the only thing that you play and you like it, you're yeah. great. So that's where this question's coming from. What, sure. what makes you great? I, I think that it is taken for me, my, the community that I come from is in, incredibly, um, even if it's false, it's very humble like the the town that I come from, you don't want to put your head above everybody else because you'll just get whacked. Right. That's like the, we just try and stay in our spot and not. So I think for me, it took a long time to even say that I'm good at what I do. Like I, you know, my wife will say like, you constantly say you're terrible at doing, you're a terrible songwriter. It's just my, my way of, I don't know what it is, but recently I've been trying really hard to just at least be honest with myself and say like, Hey, I made these records and I did this stuff with my friends and it, it's okay. We made, we did some things and it's all good. Um, so, and, and I think going through sort of the, a lot of interviews in the last couple of years as like a singer, songwriter, solo, whatever you want to call it, has talked more about the way I play guitar. Um, and so I think that one thing I, I bring to guitar is, is the open string, the way I play open strings. So I really only fret two or three notes. Um, at a time and I slide up and down sort of leaving the 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 D and the G open constantly um, and it's sort of become my thing and and I love going back to learn songs for tour because I have to go read the the um, I have to look them up online and read the transcriptions because I can't remember how to play them and it's really fun because it will tr it'll trigger things and then my muscle memory kind of kicks in but they're never right they're almost never right um, just because I play weird weird i think weird chords and the reason i play that way is because when i started playing guitar i wanted to play the guitar low and my wrist doesn't bend far enough to make power chords so it was either play high and proper or play low and what i thought looked cooler so it's all <laughs> basically i just wanted to look cooler um so i started learning I don't really I don't really know anybody else's songs. Also, that's the other thing I can't. If you told me to play somebody else's song, I couldn't I couldn't play one cover backwards. I don't know any I, like totally. Um, man, I'm the same way. I just don't I have no interest in really I'm not a big practicer and I'm not a big learn other people's stuff. Like I really like to write. Um yep. that's my main thing. So I I write on electric, unplugged in a corner of a room. I've written that way since I was 16 and I still write that way to this day. So playing it. open strings makes it louder, right? And so I play these really big, loud things. And then when you distort that and you throw some delay on it, then you just have this crazy what has now become my sound. So long answer, I think that's my, I think that's my thing. <laughs> Dude, you played guitar. Like I was envious of that just a bit when you played. And I first saw you, you playing and, and, and like the crowd is usually fixated on Cedric doing his splits and is all over the place yeah. and i'm looking at this dude in the corner playing like super low and i just thought and then you would come up to the microphone and scream yeah. your part and then go back yeah. and do your thing so yeah. good i love being um that's like a, another weird thing about my career like i love being a side man like i love it i love yeah. being like i'm a rhythm guitar player like through and through like i love just getting to go up and scream for a second and come back and and you know i love all of that stuff like I never was, uh, I was hesitant to be the front man. Um, and still, I still, it's funny cause I did, I was doing a, a podcast with Jim Atkins and, and I said, I, you know, I'm still, I still think of myself as a, as a side man. And he goes after 20 years, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> after been running Sparta for 20 years and you, and I'm like, Oh, I guess. Yeah. But I do. I still Sparta, uh, yeah. Anyway. All right. Let's <laughs> move on. Um, do you have any weaknesses that you're actively working uh, to improve on musically? Musically, um, it's, it kind of all goes to 
it's ne it's never really guitar for me. It's all vocal stuff. So yeah. the thing that I constantly work on is like not singing the same melody, singing in better. Like I'm not a hundred percent worried about pitch because whatever it is, what it is. Um, but I do believe in sort of like style and um, timber is always a thing that I'm so, like the singer for the killers has the best timber and like just the sound of his voice. Like even just standing backstage talking to him, I was like, man, you just sound, you sound cool talking. Like you have such a good <laughs> voice. So I just try and find that spot in a song where um, I allow whatever's happening in here to be the best. So that's the thing that I work on all the time. Like I sing, you know, 90% of the work on a record is singing for me. Yeah. I'm not a natural singer, so I work hard at it. Um, all right. What is the best piece of advice another musician gave you? Um, somebody, when I was in a real low moment trying to figure out where our band stood in the world, said, do you want to be Fugazi or do you want to be the Platinum? And it was... It was sort of this profound fork in the road. Um, and I've always appreciated that advice. It wasn't so much do this or do that, because I think sort of the best advice is giving you um, giving you a question that only you can answer. But if you're being honest with yourself, you're going to find the answer that fits for you. So for me, it was that answer was easy. I wanted to be the clash. I love Fugazi, but I want to I want to open I want to play in baseball stadiums like I'm, I'm good with that i just didn't know it at the time until somebody because i was struggling with with people being violent at our shows and, and getting big fast and not understanding how that how that works and so an artist who had already gone through that for a long time um sort of just posed that question to me and it was a it was an easy answer but that i always think about that advice when i'm sort of at you know what do i want to do if i'm presented with a problem i, I sort of think about that in that way like, give me give me two options, and it's usually Fugazi or The Clash, which are my two favorite bands um, that I sound like. I would say, <laughs> you know, um, and then go from there. Um, and then the last question gets into mental health just a bit, and then we're going to dive into this discussion. Yeah. We got some questions from all of us coming at you. Yeah. Um, this is the last useless qu or useful question, <laughs> and that is, uh, what's your process with dealing with? Um, performance anxiety we all have anxiety and yeah, sure. you're about to walk on stage in front of you know thousands of thousands of people w what do you do to work through that um this is gonna sound really dumb i have very little anxiety going on stage i have much more anxiety in the rest of life um i'm more comfortable on stage than I am in almost any other situation but what I do, I will say that I miss is like when, when Sparta stopped in 2008 and I, I went to Australia to play um, a festival just as with an acoustic guitar and they put me for the sideshows, they put me with Incubus. And so I would I walked out to open an Incubus show with just a guitar in Australia. And I had not had that feeling in in so long that just pure scared and adrenaline and and it sucks because it usually only lasts like one or two shows before you you're sort of you you kick into that mode automatically like i think for a lot of musicians like your brain trains itself to deal with that or else you wouldn't still be a musician right like you wouldn't play live if you couldn't handle it but i would say in that moment it, it was really just sort of leaning on the people around me like the guys in incubus who i had um become really good friends with on tour saying like you got it don't worry about it. like for me, it's just being around good people that will encourage you without fakeness, right? Like just, you know, you can do this, just go do it. And people are gonna, and honestly, the crowd in Australia, the people in the front row were like cheering me on just to start, like, you got this mate, like you got it, you're gonna do it. <laughs> and it was, I mean, this is one of my favorite places in the world. And for that reason, like nobody was like booing or sketchy or anything. People were so like, you got it, bro, <laughs> it was good. <laughs> that's funny uh australia will do that to you won't it yeah it's the best i love it <laughs> all right thank you for for giving us those useful answers to those yeah. useful questions um <laughs> we try and give the the feed something compelling to take home right we all suffer some sort of anxiety i mean we drink we pound coffee all day long so of course we're a little bit anxious all of us 
So, um, so right now, I just want to get into some questioning. From all, all three of us have questions uh, for you, and this is really about staying in tune. We yeah. all have had some sort of successes. We've had performance successes. We've had um, music industry successes. Oh, Lindsay used to tour all over the place. Mike, he managed bands that were massive. I mean, like massive. Like when I hear his catalog, you see all those gold records behind yeah, him <laughs> and platinum records. Like it's just wild. Anywho, um, you know, I've had label exp uh, uh, just experience on the on the on the on both sides now on the record side and now on the instrument side, and it's different successes. So I want to dive in. I, I'm going to give you a softball question, and then Lindsay or Mike, if you want to go next. And then we'll just go back and forth for a little bit and just try and get some useful information. All right. Yeah. That's what this is about. I'm going to go easy on you real quick. And that is, when did you know that music was your going to be your journey? Uh, so when I was 17 and I was, uh, I went to my, my school counselor for the, where are you going to go to college speech? So I guess maybe I was 16. I graduated when I was 17. So maybe I was 16. Um, and I sat in her office and just said, yeah, I have, I have zero interest in any of this other than just being in a band. So I think 17 is when I knew that's what I was going to do, at least for until I couldn't do it anymore. And then I sort of somehow lucked into continuing to do it as long as I wanted, which is pretty amazing. Mm. I, you know, mean, I mean, I just got a question. I got a question seriously from somebody, and it was, Jay, ask Jim why he's such a badass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you can that's, ask it in the feed, dude. It's that's okay. That's a good enough question. It's so good. Anyway, you can, ask, you can answer that la later. <laughs> no, uh, answer it now. Why are you? <laughs> why are you like, such a badass? How do, right. you, how do you wake up in the morning and go, man, I'm just I'm bigger than everybody else? <laughs> How do you handle that? I don't wake up <laughs> thinking I'm going to be this awesome. I just am. Um, kind of piggybacking off of Jay's, you know, talking about when you started and obviously you kind of, you, you so graciously took us through your journey, uh, starting at 17, your band at the drive-in and then experiencing the highs and then getting the lows and kind of that roller coaster. So how have you through this vast experience handled um, the no's? and the disappointments in your careers and how has that kind of shaped you into who you are today? So, I mean, the number one answer as cheesy as it is, is I've been with the same woman since I was 20. Come so on. <laughs> all the highs and lows have been um, softened both ways, right? Like somebody who can tell you, uh, you're not that great. Get off your high horse. Like, come on, go do this. And also somebody that when you're just getting really pounded, has your back, you know? So I would yeah. say I'm, I'm super lucky in that regard. I think the other thing is the community I come from. Again, it's it's a community where it's it's like our community is a compressor, right? So we don't we don't let everybody get too high, but you also don't get too low. It's very supportive and very loving. And also the, the great thing about the city is this isn't a city where if I go to dinner, no matter how big my band is at the moment, like nobody ever bothers me. Nobody ever talks shit. Nobody ever tries to like get something out of you or take something from you when you leave people will go like love your music or thanks for everything or whatever you know like that's where i come from and i think that's so ingrained in me but i would say that the number one thing is that i've my goals have been to to make records so i, I continuously am meeting my goals like it's never make a record that sells a million like i got one a long time ago i got one uh plaque whatever, like a gold record. And I actually threw it away because I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know who, like, I didn't want to give it to anyone because I don't want to go to my parents' house and see it on the wall. And I'm not going to hang it up in, in my house. And that's just my personal thing is like, I didn't know what to do with it to the point where I just put it in the trash and said, can no one ever, no one's ever given me another one. Even though records have gotten awards, like I'm off the list of like, don't give him anything because he doesn't want, and I just don't know how to deal with it. That's my own own thing. But I, I think my goals are, are just to make records. So yeah, I mean, there's disappointments for sure, but they're always out offset by meeting great people and having a blast. Right. So my, my whole thing is to just hang out and have fun and, and make records, which is 
again continue continues to happen. So that's that's I guess that's my answer. <laughs> Sorry, that's a good answer. <laughs> I love it. It's a helpful. It's a helpful answer for people. I feel like uh, I feel like I would throw out everything I have on my wall now. <laughs> and nice. I don't mean it. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Some people. Wow. Let's just let's feed Mike's ego. <laughs> womp, is... womp. No. Uh, that's it's real. It's real. You know what? The first one that I was offered, I I didn't realize I had to pay for it. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. <laughs> like the other thing is it costs. Like you got to pay for it. Yeah. And like sometimes the management company is like, okay, that's a, it's a, gonna cost you this much money. And I was like, ah, uh, it's okay. I think also, <laughs> I mean, for me personally, my, like Mike, with you, those records are from people that you worked with, right? Yes. Yeah. So for me, it's not something that I, it's not a, a part of something that I, I worked really hard to get towards. It's somebody giving me something that's non consequential to me. So if that makes sense, like I'm happy that yeah. my management, has one in their office because to them, they're like, Hey man, this is a trophy of how hard we worked because it's a different, it's a different work. My work was making the record after that. It's your work. That is no longer my work. So I don't, I can't put a trophy up for making a record, but I, I totally believe in putting up trophies for, for successful work on a record. If that makes sense. Okay. I'll leave everything on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, no, I feel makes... validated. All right, Mike, <laughs> Mike, we okay. need to hear from you. Let's ask Jim a question. What do you think? Yeah, I, I got I have a, I have one question in 72 parts. So no, I'm kidding. Um, the one question that I did want to ask straight out, and uh, I spoke with, with Jay about this before we had, before we left work today. And that's, you know, the 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 type of music um, that that you're involved with at the beginning of your career is more of a DIY style of music you went into a you made a demo you ship the demo everywhere you try to work the demo you get picked up and then you get the you know the big record deal and then you do the non-stop touring and things of that nature yeah. and it was almost like if if you go even before that but even up until the time that that you guys got signed and started doing your thing you know it was almost like well we could we 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 scrapped up enough money to get into a studio because you really couldn't do it at home it was you know you needed to go in and you needed to either know somebody or what have you nowadays diy has changed completely yeah. and you know where i am sitting this is not just my living room this is my recording studio this is my yeah. podcasting station you know yeah. so it makes it really easy to do diy as a band but with your experience, what what could you tell people that would just be starting how to separate themselves from others? Because there's so much DIY out there. Like, what 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 do you feel that that somebody needs to help separate themselves from everybody else? Tour. Sure. That's it. Because tour is the greatest filter for bullshit in the world. So if you can't tour because you're homesick then you're not going to tour. If you can't tour because you're not willing to work six months at a crappy job to go on tour for six weeks and pay for it, then you're not going to tour. If you can't go and deal with being spit at and turned down and robbed and hungry and, you know, the bigger bands on the bill, I've had literally had a headlining band. We went into the dressing room afterwards and they had a bag of potato chips. And we said, oh man, you have potato chips because we were literally that hungry. And the drummer opened them and poured them on the ground. And if that stopped me, then I wouldn't be where I am. So it's always to me is like everything that can happen to you in life is going to happen on tour because it's so accelerated. Every single day you're on tour is like a week of life. Like you drive 400 miles, you're super hungry, somebody spits at you, you still have to play, you're not allowed in the club because you're not 21. The reason that we got a record deal with Flipside Records is because we sat in the parking lot of Bob's Frolic Number no. 3 until 1 in the morning because we weren't allowed in because we were under 21. And we let every single ounce of energy that had been built up go for 30 minutes. I think we got paid like 30 bucks. But there was four people there. One of them was the drummer from Mudhoney. One of them was this guy, Blaze James, who went on to sign us at Flipside and then managed us for a long time. That's what happens when you tour, right? And the only record label that ever, so after Flipside, we sent record demos to every single label we could think of. The very last one was Fearless. 
Fearless put out that record. They were the very last label that we contacted. So, and that they saw us on tour. They saw us late at night. They didn't want to talk to us afterwards because we look like madmen, right? We're just insane. <laughs> but all of that stuff happened on tour. So my advice to everybody, and I don't care how old you are or how young you are or whatever, um, you know, it's been said many times, but get in the van. Like that is the great equalizer. And deal with it. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I love Sorry, that. Yeah. To give you some perspective, yeah. um, Jim, I think last episode I was going crazy about uh, Billy Eilish and and her brother Phineas and, yeah. and Andrew plays drums, Andrew Marshall, and I we were talking about and I kept repeating how good I went to their show in Phoenix, yeah. and it was so great to see them. But I want everybody in the feed to know they work as hard as that. It's yeah. a different scale, but they work as hard as that. If you recall, they had a show in Phoenix two Saturdays ago. They had the Oscars the next night. So they had to drive from Phoenix in the bus. They didn't fly. There was no private charter. They drove in the bus. It's not the biggest pain in the butt of a drive. And they are in a bus. True. Yeah. But it's constant for them. And they always yeah. got to put in the work. So I would totally agree as somebody in the industry you just got to pack up and you got to go and you can't be afraid but they're, they're um, also making records when she was 13 right she was right. recording records and going and playing shows and playing and yeah you know tour. How hard it is to walk into a conference room and play a song like i'll yeah. tell you this like i would rather play to fifty thousand people in japan before the biggest band in the world than to walk into a conference room with an acoustic guitar and play i it's yeah. the worst feeling in the world to me so i mean she's she's unreal like i i love her documentary I love she would she played some shows with Khalid before she sort of blew up, mm -hmm. um, one of which was in El Paso. And I mean, she she both of them, her and her brother and their family, um, they put in the work. That's a whole DIY family right there, like still there doing was, it. Right. They're still together on the road. Like, it's unreal. I mean, her yeah. first I mean, her albums were in the bed. They, they made most yeah. of their music in their bedroom. Like, that's right. and that's that's not overnight. You know, it's just, yeah. no. you know, like we always say the seven year overnight story. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. Inc that's incredible. Okay. Some say that, um, you know, at the drive-in became very popular in the early two thousands. Right. I, I, I can tell you myself, I have every single album, all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, I've been a fan for years. I've seen you in early stages. I saw you at like, I was talking to W hall and on long Island and, you know, Cedric crawled under the stage. I think we talked yeah. about that. Meanwhile, Jim's over there hanging low and doing <laughs> his, doing his stuff. You made it. And then it was gone. Mm -hmm. And then you made it again. How did you keep your head on straight? How did uh, you? I didn't is the real answer. I didn't keep it on straight at all. Like there is a, a lot of, um, a lot of years of self abuse and, trying to figure out how to not fall apart and, and relying on things that you, you shouldn't rely on to get through the day. I mean, it's, it's one of the only industries in the world where alcohol and drugs are given to you to continue working. Um, and it's, it's not cool and I don't endorse it. And, and sort of the people around me that were part of that are not around me anymore um, because of that reason. And, and the toll that that took, on the rest of my life is is unmeasurable so i made it through which is amazing and and probably mostly because when i came home i had to get it together or or be gone and i didn't want to be gone so um i did i did my best at the time but on on porcelain i sort of on the second sparta record it's kind of easy to keep it going when you're going and then when you stop and and breathe, and we were in Joshua Tree, we were at Rancho de la Luna writing the second record. Um, and I could just feel, I could feel myself mentally falling apart. And it took the whole record, the whole making of Porcelain before it really kicked off. But there was a point on tour on Porcelain where I, I looked in my phone um, because I wanted to find one person that I could call that would convince me to stay on tour. And I went through every single number in my phone and I got to the end and I went to my TM's room and said, um, you got to put me on a plane. Like I'm, um, at this point, I'm, I'm probably close to suicidal. So you need to get me home right now. I can't, I just cannot play. I cannot do this anymore. 
And it was because we had been on tour for, at that point, probably eight straight years. Um, so, I mean, I did my best, but it was also just knowing when you hit that breaking point, like you got to go home, no matter the consequences. And, and believe me, people were on the phone with me immediately saying, if you don't finish this tour, you're ruining everybody's career and you'll never get back to this level. We're playing like the Chameleon Club. Like, I'm OK if if we if we peak at 500 people, I'm, I'm good. Like, I don't need I'm all right. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't this isn't life or death. This is music. And the fact that I'm treating it like it's life or death is so dangerous that I need to step out. Um, so yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer than that. But the answer is I did it till I couldn't. Um, and then I went home and, and honestly, like didn't talk to anybody for like three months and just, I hung out in my house that I had bought and never really been in, which is a weird feeling. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, what does that light switch do? I don't even know. I don't even know what that light switch does. So. No, it's great. And we appreciate your candor. That's what this episode's about. Lindsay. Yeah. You're on mute. Oh, <laughs> amateur. <laughs> I right. muted because I was coughing and then I forgot to unmute. Also, I realized the light isn't on in this room and it's getting dark and I'm I'm in the time. same boat. It's all right. Okay. I, I was like, man, we have some chill vibes. You and me, Jim. Like we're kind of <laughs> super chill, setting the mood. We got a lava lamp right now. <laughs> turn, turn, put your phone up. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Um yeah, I, how you know, you mentioned something earlier when you were talking about what's important to you right now in this stage of your career, which is making records that are gonna that are relevant to you, right? Not for anybody else. So I guess when it comes to your songwriting process and the the story, the storytelling within the song, right? The songwriting, um, what does that look like? What is relevant to you these days? What a great and how question. are you staying in tune with it? Yeah, that? it could it could be multiple things. So on daggers, daggers are sort of like a real reaction to what was happening in the world in the summer of 2020, which was, um, you know, not, not to get political, but it was chaotic for me emotionally. And, and, and um, I mean, for everybody, we own a restaurant and I'm in a band. So the, the pandemic was pretty brutal on us. Um, and I think what I do is I just sort of take nuggets of, of, you know, you're talking about anxiety, like you take nuggets of anxiety and you put them into like maybe one or two lines in a song. And then I sort of build from there. And for me, it's a real escape. So, Sometimes, I mean, I have a, a constant muse that I live with, which is great. So love songs are sort of easy or like um, I can start with kind of one real line from our life and then I sort of expand and, and imagine it. So I always like to say that there's like a um, nothing is nothing is a uh, is what's the word uh, fiction and nothing is nonfiction. Like there's no I don't really blend either of the <laughs> <laughs> I know it works. <laughs> um, and on the eighth day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, for me, songwriting, I'm, I'm never going to run out of stuff to sing about because it could be, you know, there's a song on the new Sparta record, which I just finished. That is, it started with me, me thinking about this day when I was 12 and I, I went to the church camp. I wasn't particularly religious, but my parents liked the social aspect of the church that they went to, which is a very liberal church. Um, and we were walking through this valley from sort of the church camp area down to this like big fire that you sit around and sing songs and and whatever it is but whatever the air pressure or whatnot had just pushed all the smoke down and it became this like really like fog sort of feeling and all of a sudden i had this crazy feeling of of understanding of religion i was 12 by the way. Mm. so this is like you know discovering yourself and sort of discovering girls and discovering that your brain works differently than people told you to. And so I wrote this entire song based on this like three month period that I thought I was going to be a minister when I was 12, because I was just so enamored with this That's sort awesome. of like, like vibe, mm -hmm. you know, and then pretty much shortly discovered the dead Kennedys and was like, Nope, I'm going to, I'm going to be a <laughs> Well, Music. It, it's easy to go back to that feeling for me. And it's easy to, for that to be sort of this Genesis of, of a song. And so, you know, I just had all these immediate react. Like, I remember sitting around watching all the couples that would break off at the end of the night. And there was like this big chalice statue sort of thing in the middle of the campgrounds. And they would sort of all sit around and, and everyone's learning how to be partners or, or boyfriend, girlfriend or whatever it is until the last bell of the night. And then everybody has to scatter to the dorms. And all these things just came back to me. And, and I don't think I'll ever run out of that um, 
those things to sing about or to write about mm. because I just write about love and, and life mm. and, and sorrow and, and fear. And I think that's probably going to be with me forever. Right. So yeah, I think that's the, um, yeah, I should have stopped there. <laughs> no, love that's it. Great. Mike. So, uh, touching on the, you know, staying in tune, uh, concept and just, and just being, mm. being present, um, you know, I, I know from the bands I've worked with, you know, some of the, uh, some of the bands that you just, they just grind themselves down. You, you mm-hmm. obviously went through that. You had that experience, but a lot of the, a lot of those artists learn, and I'm sure you did as well, how to cope outside of music, because sometimes you make music the one and only, and then you hate it and you resent it and you don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. But the artists that I've worked with, you know, they had hobbies, whether it be, you know, art, uh, painting, photography, just other interests. Like what I know you have the restaurant uh, mm-hmm. and and but what else? What other you know interest do you have that you sink yourself into just when you need to when you want to put the other stuff aside and just focus on something else really, really cool? So we do we do a lot of um, chaired charity work in El Paso. So I, I, I serve on the board of the El Paso Community Foundation, which is a, a like two hundred and thirty million dollar trust that we um, we do projects in and around El Paso. It's a massive thing. I'm a, I'm a tiny piece on the board. I feel like I, I they tick their box of the weird tattoo guy um, to be <laughs> on the board, but I love it. It's a great opportunity to learn what. Uh, how to give back to the community and, and sometimes in really subtle, amazing ways that nobody ever knows is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like playing baseball. I, I, I was telling someone the other day, I, like I was saying, I play on a, um, I play on a Sandlot baseball team, which is like the, the punk rock of baseball. And I, and they're like, Oh, have you always been a baseball player? And I said, no, I've always been a 45 year old man. So I had to wait for my, my, <laughs> my body to catch up with my ability so like i was not an athlete as a young person at all like i have no athletic skill but i'm but i'm pretty okay at 45 so um i like doing that and you know some running running a business and sort of imagining what the next business is going to be and what the next thing we're going to do is is a fun part we sort of make businesses like we make records like they'll last for a certain amount of time and then we sort of move on. So Eloise has been around for 10 years, which is crazy, but we've had a studio. We had a 1500 cap theater for a long time that we were part of. Um, we've had another bar that we sort of sold off. Like it's kind of like music. If it gets too successful and stressful, like we just kind of move on to the next, the next thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. I got, I'm going to get dive deep into this question real quick. This is true or false, true or false. All rock stars who want to be professional athletes, and <laughs> all professional athletes want to be rock stars. True or false? True. True. Right? Yeah. My, my insane, bizarre relationship with the Detroit Red Wings is proof of that. Wait a second. Are you a Red Wings fan? So my friend Boyd Devereaux came to a show. Mom. We were, we were like fast friends. The next thing, like as the years progressed, it's like me, Boyd, Chelios, like when we're on tour with Pearl Jam. We're giving we're giving Chelly Jaeger shots. He's never had Jaeger before. Like he's yeah, it was it was I've had a lot of, I got to hold Brett Hull's gold stick the night that he was awarded the gold stick. And it kind of like just I was in the dressing room and it kind of just like tossed it to me. And this is somebody that doesn't know anything about sports. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. They gave you a gold stick. And he's like, Yeah, check it out. It weighs like a hundred pounds and knocked me over. And <laughs> those dudes are so fun, but they all want to tell you what guitar they have. All of them, like it's all of them. They just like, oh, I got this like sixty-five less, and I'm like, oh, that's cool, man. Like, you you guys are playing to thousands of people every night and making millions of dollars, and you you want to know what it's like to play St. Andrews? Like, yeah, you know. All right, cool. I get a text from my mom. Mom says, "Yes, Red Wings <laughs> and Tigers," and that's not even on purpose. My wife's family is from Windsor. So that's like the Tigers thing is her dad was, or her grandfather was recruited, I guess, or, or could have had the opportunity to play, but they didn't really make a good living at that time. So he couldn't, he had a bunch of kids, but um, the Red Wings was just totally because Boyd showed up at a, at a show and they were like, can we bring him in the dressing room? And I was like, I don't know who he is. Like, punk, you know? <laughs> punk rock shows, by, man. I went out like into the lobby of St. Andrews and he was getting pummeled by fans. And I was like, oh, come on back, man. Like, <laughs> 
hang out. And then we just talked about Jack Kerouac for like an hour and a half. It was the best. I'm telling you, man. My mom, I took my mom. It, my took my mom to a sh- <laughs> I was in tour. I was in town on tour. And uh, I, I can't remember. I might have been tour managing that band from New York, Madball, maybe, or H2O or something like that. And downstairs at St. Andrew's Hall, they have the shelter, right? Mm-hmm. And um, the business was playing. And so my mom ended up, rest in peace, Mick from business passed away. But my mom ends up like going and hanging out with like Mick from the business and next thing you know my mom's like, like on stage with the, with the business like what is going on here and then there's like red wings players and i i i mean it's they all want to be punk rockers so you answer oh, that question yeah. so wild okay okay uh lindsay <laughs> your turn how do i follow that Jay? i don't know oh my mom know. did ask what diy means so mom <laughs> explain that real quick do it yourself diy do it yourself no one All else right. is gonna do it lindsay your turn oh yeah um let's see i want to do i want to keep it light or is this our last round before we go into yeah it's our last round chat? Go, All right. it's our last round and then we're gonna go some q a from the feed over here Everybody's having a good time. This is okay. great. Because I had a couple questions. Let's see. Songwriting process. What uh, kind of kind of playing with uh, playing off of Mike's question a little bit. Oh, man, I don't want that one or the other one. Yeah, well, I guess playing off Mike's question a little bit with songwriting. Um, when you find yourself, in, if you have writer's block, I'm assuming you do, because I mean, everything oh, every question. songwriter has. Yeah. How 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 do you find yourself? You know, do you? How do you find yourself handling those moments? As because you, you obviously you care a lot about songwriting. So do you yeah. do you allow yourself to be in that? Do you find other ways to channel creativity? Do you sit in it? Yeah. How do you hand, find yourself navigating those moments? So it, at this point in my career, I just um, I just step away from it. It's sort of the easiest thing because right now I'm not under any sort of timeline or uh, I don't have a. We're not in the economy of of supporting households with music, so. Um, I have that luxury of just stepping away. Mm. So ideally what I would do is just stop and maybe um, just worry about other things for a while. And until, so the way I write usually is I pick up a guitar and if something happens, cool. If not, I don't worry about it. So I play, I pick up a guitar maybe every other day, probably on average. And, and if something happens, cool. If not, it's usually late at night before I go to sleep and then it sort of just permeates. And the next day there's a song kind of, it's been working pretty well. Um, but I would say like in the, you know, when we were, when we were doing this on a schedule and you're like booking tours before your record's even written, um, I sort of would immediately go to a different instrument. So I'll just go to a piano Mm -hmm. and just see if I can just break through. So I I feel like the block is there and, and maybe you just need a different tool to get through it. Um, and usually for me, I switch between guitar, which I'm very, uh, comfortable in piano I'm not and I just play by ear so it's kind of a good exercise for me to just hammer through some melodies and like you know maybe maybe let's switch this song from from fast and heavy which happened on on the last Sparta record the producer David took a very fast and heavy song and and reversed the chords and then put me on a piano and it took hours to get through but it became what if the song's called dead in signs and it's it's really turned out really beautiful only because we couldn't quite get there heavy. And then he said, no worries, brother. Just flip it, go to piano. And there you go. And sure enough, you know? Wow. <laughs> Just yeah. flip it. Just it flip sounds it. like me when someone's like, play an E minor seven. And I'm <laughs> like, what? Show me how that looks. Yeah. Oh, play it. I'm the play it real quick guy. <laughs> And then I play it and it's wrong. Yeah. And they're like, that's not that's how that. you, and I'm like, it sounds like that. Yeah. <laughs> just flip it. Yeah. That's a good quote. Uh, I would agree with Eric here. I've always been a 45 year old man. <laughs> I think that's going to be now my, that's going to be my full quote. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. All right. All right, Mike, take it away. I, I am no longer a 45 year old man. <laughs> you can always be a 45 year old man. That's yeah. Nice. I could I, once yeah. once I pass that threshold, I don't think I can go back, but I'm going to try. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I have I have 
I, you know, I, I'm on the I'm on the same fence as Lindsay. Like, do I ask the light question? Or do I ask like the cool question mm-hmm. that's you know, like mm-hmm. informative? And um, I think I'll I think I'll ask the one that's sort of in between. So um, you know, you've you've played in a post hardcore band, and then you know, at the drive-in, if you want to like put a name to it, which I don't necessarily agree with, you know, those kind of titles a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, then Sparta is a bit different. And then you had sort of like a country thing too, right? Yeah. yeah. So with all that, I mean, obviously your your influences run the gamut in many ways. Uh, but if you had to like look at all that and look at your past influences, I know you mentioned Fugazi and The Clash. Yeah. But what band, if you had to pick one, whether they you know are in existence now or existed at one time, would you have loved to have been a member of? Oh, 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 oh. I know. For me. <laughs> um, so here's here's the problem with that theoretically. Am I an addition to the band? Am I replacing somebody in the band? Ooh. You know you're what I mean? Not repla- this, you're like- not replacing anyone. You're not trying to improve or bring down the band. Yeah. You're you're there and, and the success would have been there and the songs would have been there and you would have been playing those songs with them just the vibe of yeah. you being in that band would have been immeasurable um so it would be a tie i think between uh the clash and youtube so it would be i don't know i couldn't choose between and i think because i've had some experiences in real life with you two i would go with the clash because for me the clash is still 100 percent mystery i've never met any of them i've never talked to any of them um i'm only uh enamored by them if that makes sense so yeah i'm gonna go with the clash <laughs> that's, that's the right answer by the way that was <laughs> that was the right answer that's so <laughs> awesome so i was on tour with a band in europe and we had to go to um i used to work with a juliet lewis's band and we were doing an award show for nme magazine so nme magazine had like a grammys type award show right and we're sitting in a table because Juliet had to present an award and oddly enough, she was a presenting an award to Oasis. So Oasis <laughs> was there and the pet shop boys were there, which I was like sweating. Cause that was amazing. And, uh, new order was there and Paul McCartney, sir, Paul McCartney had a table over here. And then all by himself at this one table was Mick Jones from the clash. And everybody flocked to Paul McCartney as if there was a line of people before the show. And they're like, Paul McCartney, sir, Paul McCartney. Oh, my goodness, Paul McCartney. And I was like around the corner and I went right to Mick Jones. And I was like, I did that thing, that thing kind of like, do you do you remember when you were in the clash? That was awesome. (laughs) Like it was it was a starstruck moment. And uh, it's that's that's great. I love it. All right, let's let's get some. Thank you, Jim, for hanging out and, and answering some of our questions. Let's get some questions from the feed. I've seen some good ones, Gabe. If you want to throw them up on the on the on the screen here, Jim, do you do your own recording and mix, mixing and such? So that's one of the things that the pandemic uh, really pushed me to do is start. I I lean on engineers so much, and the and the pandemic made me engineer. So I engineered all of my stuff on daggers. So all the guitars and vocals. Or on me. Um, I just have to point out real quick that Susie awesome. said Plaid Chicken, which was the name of my band with my friend Brooks, who's now in War on Women and playing with Jawbox. We had a band when we were 13 called Plaid Chicken. So thanks for reminding me of that, Susie. That's, oh, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. It's It got cooler, though, because after Plaid Chicken, we turned it into Die Pole Plaid, which was <laughs> much, much cooler. <laughs> not, not a good band. But um, yeah, so I do. I do most. I do om- almost all my own recording now, and then I mix with um, my buddy Gabe Gonzalez, who mixed and mastered uh, Daggers, and has been was our front of house and at the driving, and has pl- plays in supercars, played in Sparta, and has been my sort of my dude for a long time. So, um, yeah, it's awesome. Got another well, Gabe. Jim, sad to say, I had not encountered your music till I saw the videos from Taylor Guitar's YouTube site. This week, so we're talking about the Taylor sound check that we that we released. Yeah. If you were to take a tour of your stuff, where would he, where would he start? Where where would he get to know you 
as a musician a little better? Where should he start from? I think it would make sense to kind of go backwards from from now so that you can sort of. That's cool. So one thing to look at, um, especially because you're a fan of Taylor, like I have a solo record called, it's a really long title, um, but Quiet in the Valley on the Shores of the Indians, which has is all pretty much acoustic, um, which was a direct reaction to being tired of being in a loud band. And then I have a band called Sleeper Car, which is like a kind of countryish band, like pedal steel, alt country or something. Um, and then I would just work backwards from there. So obviously Sparta is sort of post rock, whatever. And then at the drive-in gets a little bit crazier and uh, noisier and stuff. But I say go backwards would be would be my advice. I love that. That's cool. That's a cool approach. Gabriel, <laughs> Susie, come on. <laughs> oh, that's great. Fans. <laughs> that's so good how do you pace yourself between writing performing and touring that is a fantastic question richard um so i think if it's up to me i sort of spend a lot more time writing and and recording and then i spend a lot less time touring now just because it's hard to to tour I think when I was younger, it was the other way around. I was just excited to be out in the world and seeing things. And like, you know, the first time you, you see London and, and Tokyo and Sydney, like all that stuff is so mind blowing. And now it's, um, you sort of don't look at it the same way. So I would say the, the way to pace it is I really like to make music um, and I love to share that music, but I have to do it within the sort of the, the space of my mental health. And that's more important than anything else. Wonderful. What you got, Gabe? What you got? It's so fun to go back through all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 oh, sorry. Do you have to read it first? Yeah. No. When will Sparta come <laughs> to play Mexico? Oh uh, yeah, we've been trying to figure it out. So it's on. It's on. It's sort of in the. It's definitely in the desire category um i love to play i've only gotten to play mexico city and we played a couple of times <laughs> in Florida, and i love it um so yeah we actually we kind of always have this conversation with trying to find the right bands to do it with but you know these days it's all about kind of a, a package of people that share stuff and makes it economically feasible so we don't have to i i hate high ticket prices so i try and find uh ways of touring that don't require Good amounts of money to come see the show. So hopefully soon is my answer. Um, we appreciate that. Yeah. Jim, what do you think of Taylor Guitars, bro? <laughs> so I'm sure I've told this story before, not on this podcast, but um, after meeting Jay, he said, we talked about guitars for maybe like 10 minutes. And then you said, we're going to watch a bunch of videos of you playing and then we're going to set it up to the way you play and then we're going to send it to you and i actually had like a charity uh live stream that i the guitar came to my house and it got there in time that i could use it for this other charity thing so i took it down to this art gallery and took it out of the case and started playing and it was in tune when i sat down and played it and i was like this is unreal and it played <laughs> it, i mean it played amazing so i think that's a um what kind it is builders right builders edition 517 yes. is what so, he's got yeah that's my jam and now i have the the travel one which i just took to austin and played songs for at the baseball game as well the the gt urban ash yeah oh, so, nice, nice. which has the wildest fingerboard on it it's so dope it was probably one of the coolest so there were a handful of them and i was looking through when, when Sergio and I were picking in these guitars up to drive them up, Sergio came up and did that uh, session with us, Lindsay and Mike. And we opened this one up and it was like, wild. It's remember it's eucalyptus. It's not ebony. Right. So it's yeah. like the super tiger stripey eucalyptus. Yeah. I was like, he's got to have it. Wild. It's real. I also, and you'll appreciate this was playing. So I, I played two songs during the seventh inning stretch at this, this place called the long time which is the Sandlot Baseball Park in Austin. And I didn't realize till I was maybe halfway through the first song that I was still wearing metal cleats. And there was like all these chords on the stage. And it, all I could think about the entire time was not stepping on a chord. And I became paralyzed with fear 
that I was going to break their stuff with my stupid cleats because I didn't think to take them off before I played the song. So, but I didn't, I didn't break any chords. <laughs> so, were you playing the songs in uniform? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll send that's you. That's tight. Yeah, that's so. That's that's like a, that is the best of every world right there, yeah. right? Exactly. And that was my second time. We we did it in 2018. I also played. And I actually played with their backing band. They have a they have a full band at the long time. They play, the tender the Spank the tender thing. It's great. That's like when you're in your high school when like the handsome quarterback wins <laughs> homecoming king. You know what I mean? And he's it's he's got to vibe out with like the homecoming queen, and he's she's all dressed beautiful, and he's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly so good. Yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. All right, Gabe, let's do three more questions if we got them and then we'll move on. Jim, so what is more important to you, recording or performing? Fantastic question, Philip. It is, but it's kind of I I've never had one without the other one and I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to choose. Um obviously like to create stuff, but then I'm a social person and and I'm uh, I do feel so comfortable on stage. Again, that's like probably my space in the world so I, I couldn't have one without the other one and the other thing is like i don't want to perform the same songs forever to whatever <laughs> audience so i have to record in order to at least be able to like keep that water moving you know i love it mm -hmm. i once told somebody you know i worked in the label world and i had a band and and uh you know i i would get demos all the time and i would have to go to these you know showcases if you will and i remember going to a show in jersey and after and the it was terrible it was terrible it they weren't ready to be a band and i'm like contemplating as we're supposed to have this meeting after the show and i was like ah, you, know, er, and you know walking back there and i just did it i just i'm like someone in their life has to be the guy, the honest guy and I said, look, guys, are you in your favorite band? And they're all like, no. And I said, well, <laughs> until you're in your favorite band, you yeah. guys need to stop. That's a great point. Like, you got to be in your favorite band. You got to listen to your own music. And like, really, if you don't want to put on those records, yeah, may maybe do something different. Just saying. Anyway, you, you love your music. It's great. <laughs> all right. Gabe, two more questions. Since your only recent Taylor, since you're an only a recent Taylor player, what were your other gutu, acoustic acoustic wow. acoustic guitars favorites? I know the J45. Yeah, yeah. So I have a '68 J45. Um, that's like my old faithful, and that's that's really all I got. <laughs> And there was a guitar, actually, you know, speaking of what, why we couldn't do this last Tuesday, I went to a funeral for a guy who owned the studio that was the first studio I ever recorded in. Um, and he was like a, a big a big guy in our world in El Paso. Um, when the engineer from that studio left, whose name is Mike Major, also produced Porcelain, when he left that studio, he gave me the, the acoustic guitar that sat in the corner that everybody would figure out parts on. And it's, there's no name on it. It's all worn off. Um, but it's it's such a great play. I have no idea what kind of guitar it is, but it's such a great player. And I still have it to this day. It's like one of my prized possessions of, you know, childhood and, and the thousands of hands that played that guitar and, and figured out songs on it. It's just so much soul to it. So those are my only two other acoustics, I think. And oh, I have a, a Fender Paramount that I also would tour with. So those are my three. Now I'm, now I'm a Taylor guy. So now you're a Taylor guy. Taylor only. And I didn't even tell, I told Jim what guitar we were sending. That's how it worked. Yeah. yeah I don't I know don't. if you remember, but Lindsay knows the drill. Yeah. If somebody plays it, I mean, I'm like, mm, yeah. I got this for you. Here, I'll send yeah. it. You'll yeah. like it. Yeah. I remember, I, I remember that conversation. You, you said, you're what? And I said, <laughs> I'm going to get videos of you playing guitar. I'm going to send it to Ter Terry and Terry's going to watch these videos and yeah. he's going to set it up just like that. He's like, no way. That's some I, sort of sorcery. Yeah. I believed I believed you, but <laughs> I didn't understand until I played it. So I'm like, okay, I get that you're gonna do that, but I didn't realize that it actually worked. Like I didn't realize <laughs> that you get the guitar and it's like, oh, we, we were we we're on a dating now, me and you, me and this guitar. <laughs> was quite dry. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, our guys know what's up. Yeah, they do. 
I mean, Terry Myers has been on the show. These folks have met him. They met him a long time ago, and we should have him back, actually. We should. Just insider information here. All right, one more question, Gabe, and then we will move on to Lindsay's question. Oh, man, pressure. You're under pressure. Uh, so any tours in the works, and what's your favorite city to play? Fantastic question. Um, so, yeah, touring is in the works. Like Obviously, like everybody else, the last few uh, – years have been hell on what you're going to do and when you're going to do it and then not doing it and then refunding and then rescheduling. And then, so yeah, we have, we have stuff that will be announced, I think in June, um, that we're doing. So I, I will see you guys soon. Um, but, uh, my favorite city, I mean, honestly, my, my favorite place to play in the world is Ecuador. I will play there for the rest of my life as long as it exists. If they'll have me. Um, but my favorite city to play is probably London, I think. Just because I like, I love the old dirty pubs and punk rock joints. And like, that's such the the birthplace of what I love so much. Um, that's, that's just, I love that city. I love walking around and I love playing there. So yeah. Even, even when it's super rainy. I got one question before we, before we go to Lindsay's question. Uh, and that is, what is your favorite venue catering? So it used to be Bottom of the Hill, the veggie burger at Bottom of the Hill was my <laughs> yeah. favorite. And then uh, the Middle East oh. is is like once if you're playing the Middle East, then you know like you're covered because I'm vegetarian. Yeah, um, most mostly plant based. Um, yeah, those are kind of the two. Now, now it's like everywhere you play. If if you're not careful, you'll just eat Impossible Burgers every day, and then it's just like the same junk food that everybody else is eating, but didn't come from an animal. Um, but I'd say like, honestly, the middle East back in the day was like, that was like such a good day on tour. Cause you knew, you, I mean, you knew you're not going to get a buyout, but you know, you're going to get like the best hummus on tour. So <laughs> well, it's, it's totally worth it. yeah, I would say those two places. Right. Sometimes when you have uh, your tour routing, you would circle the like the calendar. You would circle the date where yeah. the good food was going to happen, and then you yeah. fig you figure out all the rest of the food that you're going to get. Often you got to have one food bully on your team, yeah, and they got to tell you where you're going to eat, and you just get used to it. I will say this too, though, um, and I've been friends with the guys for a super long time, but because Sleeper Car is a band that was palatable to their audience, I got to finally go on the road with Coldplay and there it was the the Viva Viva tour and their catering that they toured with was the most far out insanely good food every single night and it's not just for the band like this is full catering for crew and openers and everybody it was just so over the top delicious and the best people and just like honestly the best that's the best catering I've ever had in my life easily that's so good mm. all right all right, Gabe, thanks for throwing those questions up there. Thanks, everybody, for sticking it out and hanging out with us and getting to know Jim just a little bit better. Okay, so we have a segment. We're going to bring back Andy Lund, and he's <laughs> going to sing a song. We're going to fly him in real quick. He's going to sing a song, uh, and we're going to do a segment of the show we call Lindsay's Question. This is where we get she tries to stump you. It's great. Okay. Gabriel, take it away. Mr. R. Trying to find out who you are. Who knows what's on her mind? But when you're gone, you will find she got to know you. So what? What happened? So Mr. R. So oh, this man. is great. So these videos came from like I was dig digging. So the, we had Ed Robertson from Bare Naked Ladies on. He's a big Taylor guy. He's such a. That is a guy. If you don't know him, you need to know him. That was Mr. R. Remember? <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, I thought Andy was saying Mr. Ward. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. We, no, that that makes. I was like, "Who's Mister R?" Mister Ward. Was... So we thought it sounded kind of close, <laughs> and we went with it anyway. That was so fantastic. I love that dude. We miss him. Oh man. All right, yeah. Lindsay, take it away. Okay, but first I have to ask Jim: Are you like? Are you a Harry Potter fan? I've read the first book, and I've seen right, some of the movies. That. Okay, we won't go with that and, question then. And I've been to Universal Studios and had <laughs> had a beer with with a guy who refused to break character. The bartender refused to break character, and he kept calling me. What do you call him? A muggle? Is that what it's called? What, I think what's so. The, the non wizards are called something or whatever. And he kept saying like, "Oh, you're just a blah blah blah." And I was like, "Your name tag says Phoenix. Like, <laughs> it says you're from Phoenix." <laughs> Like, I'm well, cool if you're going to stay in character, but take off the name tag, Bert. That's you're funny. Phoenix. Listen, I'm not a huge, I'm not a fan. I'm probably, I probably know less than you, maybe a little bit more, but I, uh, I know that Harry Potter fans like this question. So I was going to ask you, but now we're switching it to my backup question. Okay. You're not, you're not diehard enough, dude, for this oh, question. Oh, no. <laughs> so um, this would be, uh. if you could rent a, if you could rent, or they're going to not even rent, they're going to give you. A, a, a billboard for a year to put up any message you want to put up. I love this question. What would you put up? What would be the message you send out to the to the world, to the neighborhood you're in? Uh, I think it'd just be forgive, honestly. Mm. Oh, wow. Just because I, I think that. that's probably the thing that hangs up that. most of us the most is not being able to, and I'm not saying forget or whatever, but I, I do think that that to me is... Like if I had a billboard and I could put up one phrase, I think it would just be that one because you would see it and you would think, who or what do I need to forgive? And then it would start you on that path. Maybe that's my answer. Wow, that's deep. Final that, answer. That, that's beautiful. <laughs> right? Lindsay, I told you I told you this would be a good show. <laughs> this is yeah, what I'm so saying. Fun, I I, no stumping I, will be what's the, can I hear the Harry Potter question though? Just because I want to hear it now. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they love to be answered this question. If you were to attend any of the Hogwarts, which Hogwarts house would you choose? Oh, I took the quiz and I was the same one that Harry Potter is, but I think I was answering it like a little too goody two shoes. So which I don't oh. remember which house he is. The I don't know. Could I be? I mean, definitely not Slytherin because I'm not. I'm not yes. even. I'm not even cool evil at all. Like I'm not. I'm a geek. So uh -huh. I think I'm just being the, the house of the geeks. The House of the Geeks? Yeah. Like the overly <laughs> honest, sincere geeks. That's what I would be in. Okay. That's a good I'm house. That's yeah. a good house. Yeah. That's a good house. Not the, the not the Hufflepuff or the, what are they? The Slytherin or the, Ra what was he in? The Slytherin. I think the, Ra yeah. is it Ravenclaw? Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw. I feel like maybe I could, like if I was hanging out with the right people, I could be in Ravenclaw. Like I could sort of yeah. ride their coolness maybe, but yeah, yeah no. Yeah, see, if any Harry Potter fans, Gryffindor, are watching, yeah, they're probably, yeah, they're probably mad at us because you don't talk Harry Potter unless you know what you're talking about. And they're like, I'm, I'm pretty certain <laughs> I, I would be, I would be House of Pancakes, Hufflepuff. Okay, that would work Hufflepuff. really well for Hufflepuff. me. Hufflepuff. House of Pancakes. International, Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff. Internationally, you would be that. Is there a domestic House of Pancakes? I had it. Yet. You got it. That's what I'm saying. Start it. You know, on tour, <laughs> if we could go back to this, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Jim. It might be in San Diego. It, like it could have been just outside of San Diego, but there was a Denny's that got bought out by by some by some private family, and they renamed the Denny's Keith's. Oh, and that's Keith's, perfect. as in Keith, right? Keith's. And it was the same branding, it but did. it just said Keith's. <laughs> and no, I've been, did. You're right. Yeah, it might be. About. It might be the vibe, the one that's like on the way up north, maybe. Right. Yes. Yes. And I I, I want to say it was here, but now it's at Denny's again. Oh, but anyway, oh. it was just oh. it, uh, Hufflepuff. That's all I got. All right, you know what time it is. You know what time it is. We're not even to dive into the song. We're just going to go right into this useless clip. We're going to do use a useless clip right now. Jim, this yep. is this where this show gets wild. Ready? Check this clip out. Yes. Two minutes of sports. That was wild. 
<laughs> right? Two minutes of sports. It's, it's going back to his question real quick. And that question was, all rock stars want to be athletes. So, Jim, mm -hmm. yeah. Jim, you are a uh, Spurs fan, aren't you? Yeah. Big time basketball fan. What are you, more of a basketball fan or an MLB oh, fan? I'm, I'm more of a college basketball fan, I think. Like, we go to every UTEP minor home game and follow it pretty closely and – yeah, so that's like my main, and mostly because, like, I, I just jumped on Christine's sports train. So kind of, she she went to UTEP and loved basketball, and it's kind of a thing in our community. Like a lot of people go to the games. So. But yeah. All right. How do you, are you excited about the uh, uh, NBA playoffs at all? Well, the Spurs aren't in, so I I pretty much am out of the. I'm not a big. I'm not really rooting for anybody. I kind of, I mean, I like Steph Curry a lot, so I'll watch. Yeah, I'll watch yeah. Steph play. Um, yeah. So if you don't have a dog in the horse race, you don't really care. I mean, I'll I'll watch, but I'm not I'm not I'm not huge into it. No, like we watch. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I watched a lot most of the the March Madness just for to watch. Call I like college ball better. It's wild. That's why you yeah, never know what's up. Things can happen. Yeah. Crazy. We're big Michigan State family, so we we back uh, Coach Izzo there. But you know what happened to them? They played this team called Duke. Yeah. <laughs> just good for good for Coach K. It's just normal. It's just uh, yeah. Anyway, so last night, um, <laughs> last night they they some sports announcer said that. Let me find it real quick. And it's right here because I shared it today because I thought it was hilarious that the Warriors big four now, as they're saying, their big four have been nicknamed PTSD. Yeah. How yes. do you feel about that? <laughs> right. So it's Poole, Thompson, Stefan and Draymond. How do you feel about that? I think it's fantastic. Lindsay, how do you feel about that? I love it. It's cool. It's a cool it's a cool name to have. Right. And I think there's truth. There's truth to it. Yeah. PTS. I mean, people are like, wait, we thought you guys were done. We thought this dynasty <laughs> was yeah. done. And he, what is happening? It's like, yeah. They interviewed Trey or they interviewed Clay Thompson last night and after the after the game, and he goes, I mean, Steph made me look stupid tonight. He played for 16 minutes and scored 34 points. That's he, insane. He gets five threes. I, I'm trying to do that too. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, it's great. Okay, so MLB, the Tigers are your are your team. Yeah, um, re recent converts actually following closely though. So, so I'm not I'm not like I told you I'm I'm a novice when it comes to it. Yeah. Well, oh, there's only since, since we're well since we're following the Tigers closely. Let me inform you they lost. Ooh. Well, yeah, to the yeah. Yankees, my yeah. Yankees. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I just needed to get that out. Because I have no joy in life, and the Yankees won, and now I have a modicum of joy. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's I mean, if the Yankees are good, baseball's good. You know how I feel. That's you know fair. how I feel that's about fair. that. And I sooner do, than yes. later, we're gonna have Yankees own Derek Dietrich on the show. So it's fine. We'll have some Yankees. I better people. come back for that one. No, we got to make sure <laughs> Lunda's here. <laughs> It's going to get weird. Anyway, thanks for two minutes of sports. That's it. I try and turn every single Taylor podcast into a sports show. Yeah. I think it's more fun. Um, and now we have a segment called Evan's Question. Evan's Question is trivia. We don't have Andy Lund to sing a song tonight, but you guys know how this works. Trivia works like this. There's only three rules. Gabe, Gabe O'Brien, Paul Tobias, and Evan Smith cannot answer the question. The rest of you can. If you answer the question correctly and you are the first to answer the question in the feed, Gabe will put it on the screen. If you win, send us an email to primetime at taylorguitars.com and we'll send you a, a, a prize pack. All right. This is a pretty simple question for some people who are guitar nerds, who are especially Taylor guitar nerds. All right. Here we go. You guys ready for this? Get ready for trivia. Gabe. Throw the question up, please. In 2004, Prince played MTV Unplugged. What Taylor guitar model did he play? I'll give you a hint. It was purple. <laughs> That's all I got. 
Maybe we do have a song. Do we have a song? No, we don't have a song. You know what we could do? Here's what we'll do. Oh, shoot. Here we go. This uh, backing track is called Feeding the Ducks. <laughs> have, you seen, have you seen Prince's solo? There it is. There you go. Uh, well. Yeah. Okay, it's not a complete it. answer, it though, is it? It's not a complete answer, but. <laughs> oh, do they both That's win? Kind of. Well, I, I, Sambo76 also has a purple icon, so my vote is to go that way because it's a complete answer with color coordination. Yes. Do they both win? That's the big question. You know what? On today's show, they both won. I like Guys, that. hit me up and we'll get you a prize pack. That was good. Both of them feed. We <laughs> The ducks have been fed. You are correct. Jim, I think we were cutting you off. No, no, I was just going to say, in case you haven't watched it recently, go watch Prince's solo on the George Harrison tribute uh, while my guitar gently weeps is the most ridiculous Gosh. thing you'll ever see. And just at the end when he throws it and kind of looks at him like, and then walks off, just go watch it again. Everything about <laughs> Prince. We could have a whole episode about Prince, I think. We could have a whole show. Yeah. We could have a whole show just called I Prince. Am a I am a die-hard Prince fan. Yeah, easily one of my favorite guitarists and artists. And yeah, yeah, I, I, that was his passing was tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, everybody, we're gonna have a show about Prince someday, and it's gonna be awesome. Uh, I am a huge Prince fan. You I think I think he's so wonderfully missed. You should. Um, He's such a wonderful player. And my favorite part in that when he's performing cream and he stops halfway through and he goes, you know, I wrote this song about me, right? <laughs> it's, it's so great. It makes me so happy. Anyway, we do not have Andy Lund to sing us out. So guys, as you guys are, as you guys are running away tonight and saying goodbye, sing that tune in your head. What time is it? Boom, boom, Andy... boom, boom. What <laughs> was it? What, what was, was it? it? Time, time. Anyway, Jim, man, we can't thank you enough. Man. Oh, it's such an honor to have you on the show. Yeah. It's so great to know you. And uh, I mean, thank you. We are so grateful that you 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 gave us this time. It was a long podcast and it was worth it. We had a lot of uh, comments over here in the feed talking about well, this is thank one of everybody. the best shows. Yeah. Um, yes. So we, many people. we appreciate you so much and look at all this stuff. Uh, what the heck was it? That's right, Phil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Thank you guys. I really enjoyed Jim. Guys, get to know Jim a little bit better. His music is out there. Check out his sound check on our YouTube channel. And again, we appreciate you guys so much. We will see you next week. All right. Bye. We're signing off. I wish there there's music. Here's what we'll do. Play, play that music. Play that music again. The okay, ducks. but we're gonna do Have should we do dance pop or acoustic cinematic? Dance pop. No. Dance pop? Yeah. Oh. Dance pop. Yeah, dance pop. All right. Yeah. Wait. It hasn't dropped yet. <laughs> what was it? What was it? <laughs> Sounds like a 16 year old with a groove box. Prime time. Prime time. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>